this morning on that big old storage for that big old box now. Are they going to get mine at home? Like the one in Hexco?
Senior Director in Workforce Readiness at Northwell Health, and I welcome you to our eighth annual Spark Challenge event. Due to the pandemic, this is the second time we're hosting this event virtually and hope next year we can meet again in person. Over the past eight years, we've had thousands of students visit our sites to learn about the wide array of careers available in healthcare. We have 1,200 high school students participating in this two-part event. Today, part one, Career Connections, we'll give you a look at some clinical and non-clinical careers, which our 78,000 team members perform on a daily basis. Every single career, whether you're working with a patient, hiring talent, performing research, working in dietary, or any one of our hundreds of roles, you make a difference to our patients. None of this would be possible without the support of our extraordinary leadership team who inspire us to strive for excellence in all that we do. Michael Dowling, Mark Salazzo, Joe Mascola, and Maxine Carrington. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce the President of Strategic Initiatives and Chief Operating Officer and a huge supporter of the Spark Challenge, Mark Salazzo. I'm excited to be able to welcome you to the 2022 Spark Challenge. Over the past five years, more than 3,000 students have participated in the program, and we've partnered with 200 plus Northwell teams across all parts of our organization. We're always looking to grow our workforce, and we're excited to teach you more about us and the work that we do. We hope this experience will initiate your interest in healthcare and that you'll keep in touch with us as you consider future career paths. My advice for all of you is to keep an open mind, ask as many questions as possible, and don't think of this as an experience that ends with the presentation in April. Make connections, exchange emails, stay connected. You never know where your journey will lead you. My journey started about 35 years ago in Albany. I was going to school at night, earning my master's in health systems administration, while during the day I was working on a hotline for the New York State Department of Social Services. My plan was to finish my education and then join one of the consulting firms. And if I worked real hard someday, maybe I'll be able to be a CEO of a hospital, small hospital in upstate New York. That was my original plan. 15 years later, at the State Department of Social Service, I advanced my career. I wound up working with a gentleman who was a real visionary in healthcare, Michael Dowling, and we had fun doing what we were doing. Michael got a job down at then North Shore University Hospital, fledgling North Shore Health System, and he recruited me down soon after. And 25 years later, we created Northwell Health. Today, I oversee 22 hospitals and 850 ambulatory locations. So my advice is you never know where your career path will lead you. Take the first step. Take that first step with us. Learn, make friends, make connections, and have fun doing it. Be passionate about what you do and always look to the future. So welcome to the 2022 Spark Challenge. All right, thank you so much, Mark. Hi everyone, my name is Catherine Graves. I am the project manager in the workforce readiness department. Uh, I wanted to take a few minutes to go through the agenda. So you'll be able to find that on the agenda page. Um, and just take a note that these sessions should end a little bit earlier than what's scheduled, just to give yourselves and your classmates a few minutes of a break, as well as to prepare for the next session. Some of the content today is live and some is pre-recorded. Uh, both of those options take a lot of time and effort to do, and we do want to thank the professionals who took the time to ensure that the best method was used to showcase their career. Some of the technology aspects today, since we will be using the WUVA platform, wanted to make sure that we all have the technology down. Um, at the top right, you'll see the Q&A button. Please submit any questions there, and our professionals are going to try and chat your answers after their session the emphasize button. So if you have a question that's already asked, go ahead and click that button and this will bring it to the top of the list so the speaker can see it. Chat, so you can use this to kind of say good morning, welcome, if you have any general questions about the day, 
or about technology, but please try to keep any questions that you have in the question tab. Community boards. So feel free to use and chat and post in these boards that are already created, but please do not create any new boards as they will be deleted by our team. Just a general note for the day. Even though this is a virtual conference, this is an academic event focused on career knowledge. So please keep all questions and comments professional, kind, and focused on career discussions. You will gain the most throughout the day if you participate in the activities. Keep an open mind to the six careers that are highlighted here today. Part of learning is learning what you like and what you dislike. So with that in mind, let's go ahead and begin our family medicine physician. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Sparks Challenge 2022, uh, Becoming a Physician. My name is Dr. Tochi Rokumaliz, and I'm the Senior Vice President and Chair of Family Medicine. So to get started, today's agenda, we're going to be discussing how to become a physician. We're going to go through a pediatric case, an adult case, what's the latest technology in medicine, and some of the frequently asked questions about a medical career that are asked by students like you. So becoming a physician. There are some steps to becoming a doctor. The first thing is you've got to go through college, you're a college undergrad, then you go to medical school. Eventually you choose what kind of specialty you want to do, what kind of position you want to be, that's residency fellowship. And then after you've finished that, you're practicing in the world and you're continually educating yourself and staying on top of the literature. So here it is in a different schematic for you. You've got your four years of high school, that's what you're doing right now. Then you're going to do college. You can either do pre-med or something else, but it's four years of college. And then medical school, which is another four years. And then you do residency, which tells you what type of physician you want to be. Do you want to be a pediatrician, a cardiologist, etc.? Now, this four years of medical school and four years of college is sometimes that's how it is. That's the usual route, but there are different ways to get there, and I'll talk about that later. So, undergraduate education, that's your college education. First thing you got to do is apply. And of course, you're going to need to use your advisors and counselors who are up to date on what's needed to enter college. Uh, so get as much information as you can from different advisors and counselors and, and know what you need to do to get there. College is expensive, so you need to learn about the state and federal repayment plan programs that are out there, as well as loan and scholarship databases. So find that from your religious organizations, community organizations, your school, your parents may belong to some associations or some clubs, et cetera, that will give out these scholarships. So look far and wide, cast your net really large to find out what resources are available for you. So you've done your application, you've gotten into college. All right. So while in college, when you're in college, what do you need to do? So any college major is good. In the old days, they said you had to do a pre-med, you had to do science. It's not true today. You could be an arts major, you can do a music major, you can do anything you want. The only thing is that they're, they're going to say that if you want to go directly from college to medical school, you'll need to have done some English, math, and science courses as well. If you didn't do that, that's okay because you may have gone a different route. And then afterwards, if you decide you do want to go to medical school, then there are some extra courses that you can do on the side to get those courses out of the way and then apply to medical school. But if you're, whatever major you're doing, just make sure you do have English, math, and science courses under your belt if you know that you're definitely going to go to medical school next. It's good to have a good GPA, 3.5 about, but it's not absolutely necessary. Um, so, you know, you say, okay, but how do I calculate it? So here it shows you A plus is like a 4.3, A is a 4.0. Uh, a B minus is a 2.7, a C is a 2.3. So you really want to be above the C and a higher uh, to make sure that you're good to go um, to get into a program. Again, different medical schools have different criteria. Some of them, some GPA is part of it, but then they may have a holistic approach where they're looking at your other experience as well. So keep that in mind. So don't be discouraged. 
extracurricular activities are important while you're in college as well um, if, uh, in high school too. Work experience is important. So showing that you are a multifaceted individual, that you did sports or you did photography or you were interested in other things. Um, work experience, did you help to, you know, with pool cleaning during the summer or did you paint? Uh, were, you, are you, were you a lifeguard? Did you, were you a barber or a hairdresser? Did you walk dogs? Did you have some sort of experience where you had to earn a living um, or earn some money and you understood how to uh, handle that? So that's important to have those extracurricular activities as well as work experience. Shadowing opportunities while you're in college is, is, is important if you can. Uh, it doesn't matter exactly where. If you can shadow someone who's in the healthcare field, great. If you can't, that's okay. But it shows that you are also looking out for people who are leaders in their fields and that you're seeing how they progress in their job, their day-to-day -day activities, in their careers, et cetera. So, Shadowing is important. If you can get that under your belt, that would be great. Now in college, you're also going to think about what's called the Medical College Admission Test. It's the MCAT, and it has four sections. So that's a test that you take, just like if you're going to go into law school, you take the LSAT. For medical school, you need the MCAT. Um, so it has four sections, living systems, biological systems, behavioral and critical analysis, and reasoning skills. And so those are the sections. It's about a 25 percentage uh, for each of them. And so having that knowledge ahead of time, there are loads of review courses, online uh, practice tests, et cetera. But that's why they said that it's necessary to try and get, make sure you have English, science, and math under your belt um, so that you're able to take the MCAT. Your first two years, usually, if you're doing the typical four, four-year medical school program is basic sciences. Some schools like Hofstra, at Zucker's School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell, they've created where the clinical sciences are mixed in with the basic sciences. So you're, you're, you're jumping in from the get-go, from the beginning. But the traditional schools, the first two years are basic sciences. The last two years are where you now go through the clinical rotations. You're seeing what is surgery, you're learning about internal medicine, you're learning about OBGYN, you're learning about psychiatry, et cetera. Again, for the Zucker School of Medicine and Hofstra, you're doing all that from the first year. They're mixing both the basic and the clinical sciences together. Then the elective time is to use to help figure out what you want to do. While you're in school, you're going to be taking two exams. Uh, one is the step one exam and then the step two exam to get you ready so that you can now move on to residency upon graduation. Throughout this process, make sure you have your mentors. And then you're, in your fall year of your final year, you're going to be applying for residency. And residency is the kind of specialty you want to be, uh, what kind of doctor you want to be. So you're going to be applying to different residency programs. So if you want to do peds, you're going to be applying to a number of pediatric programs. If you want to do obstetrics and gynecology, you'll be applying to those programs. If you want to do family medicine, same thing. All those interviews happen in the fall of the year because by the spring, summer, spring of your final year, you will be matched into a residency program and you'll know where you're going to specialize. So that's residency. And if you end up doing some more of that, um, you're going to do a fellowship if you want to get even further specialization. So residency is the final training to, you get to be a specialized as a physician. And that is the overview of your medical education. And the next step we're going to have is the pediatric case. For doctors, especially family doctors, we get to see a lot of different types of cases. So my first case is a pediatric case. And what I have here is a 15-year-old who's team captain of one of the sports teams. And he comes in with complaints of fatigue, uh, loss of appetite, and insomnia. So when we do the exam, all doctors, we, the first thing we do, of course, besides uh, cleaning our hands and everything, we'll put on our gloves. So if you have your gloves at home, you can put your gloves on. We like to do vital signs first, check to make sure if the person doesn't look like they're in distress, that's good. We're going to try and get a, a thermometer and do the temperature. So if you have the tactile therm thermometer, you would use that over here at this site. So if you have the paper thermometer, you put it on your forehead. Here we'd use uh, one of these electronic ones that we would just put on the forehead like this and check. Temperature is good. We would also want to check the pulse. So basically, 
touching the inside of the wrist and counting the beads. And then count that for 15 seconds, multiply times four, and that gives you the heart rate in one minute. The same thing in terms of breathing. You can either put your hand on the person's chest or you can just watch it and watch for 15 seconds, multiply times four, and that gives you the breathing rate in one minute. And so these are important vital signs that we would do. Next step is to listen to the heart and lungs. So we're going to listen. You take your stethoscope. So your ears, your eardrums face forward towards um, your eyes. So you have these pointing this way towards forward. So move those forward, put them in your ear. Check the bell of your stethoscope. Usually you have two sides. So you want the side that's flat tap that, make sure you hear that sound, that tapping in your ears, and then you would place it. I'm going to please put this under. I'll go under and I'll put it, my hand there, and then I'll listen to the heart. Do the same thing when it comes to listening to the lungs, the top on one side and the top on the other side, listening to the tops of the lungs. I'll do something similar in the back and I'll listen to the lungs up, down, on both sides. If I were listening to the heart, let them just breathe normally and pay attention to the heartbeat and how it's beating. In, these area, in this um, era of COVID, after doing that, I would take the swab just to wipe it down because I would use my stethoscope for the next patient. So his physical exam, no distress. Um, everything seems normal, his vital signs are good, and his heart, lungs, everything seems really good. But because I know that he's had tiredness, loss of appetite, I've got to think about other things that are going wrong. So I'm going to test, do send out blood work to see about his thyroid, because the thyroid is kind of your engine that helps your body to move, and see whether that's working. And I'm going to check to make sure you don't have any vitamin deficiencies and you're not anemic. As an adolescent, I've got to make sure that everything is okay with you. So I'm going to do a questionnaire question to find out, have you been feeling kind of depressed lately? Have you thought of suicide? No. Okay. So have you ever thought of suicide in the past? No. Okay. So I know you're, you may have some signs of depression, but I know you're not thinking of suicide and that's very important. And so because of that, I'm going to give you this information. There's the hotline, 1-800-273-8255 or 1-800-273-TALK. That's a number you can call if you ever feel more anxious, somebody to talk to 24-7, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And we'll get your lab work and see how things progress. Okay? Okay. So that concluded our pediatric case. The next case we have is an adult case. My next patient that's come in is a woman. She's in her 50s and she's coming in today with shortness of breath and a little bit of coughing for the past several months. She had COVID in December last year. You were hospitalized and at the time of the admission, you had a shortness of breath, sore throat, changes in taste and smell, fever and fatigue, but you were never intubated. Thank goodness. Uh, you recovered and you were discharged. 
And earlier this year, you got your two doses of the Pfizer vaccine and you had your booster in just in October. But you just realized that you've been having shortness of breath with exertion, occasional coughing, no fever, no sore throat, and you haven't had any sick contact. And you did have the flu vaccine. So that's good, you've had both vaccinations. And you noticed some issues with your memory, um, if, uh, if I recall, but you were worried, thinking that maybe it's because of the stress of the pandemic. When I did the exam, I listened to your lungs, a little bit of some, some sort of crackles or, you know, that I'm a little concerned about. And so you're having issues with breathing, so I'm worried about your lungs. Our patient was sent to get an x-ray of the lungs. Now you'll see four different x-rays. Please log on to crowd.live forward slash spark to vote for which x-ray you believe is abnormal. We're going to wait a few minutes as the votes come in. All right, so if you chose options B, C, or D, you are correct. A is a normal scan. The, there are clear lungs on either side of the heart. B showed a pneumonia from bacteria. Cloudy more on the patient's left. C showed a pneumonia from a virus. Not as cloudy, but it is on both sides. And D showed pneumonia from COVID-19. It is cloudy on both sides. Luckily, our patient came back with a normal x-ray, so let's continue our visit. And you're so also having issues with memory, so I want to make sure that you're not having any little minor strokes or little seizure activities that are happening. So we're going to get a CAT scan of your brain. Now we sent the patient to get a CT scan of the brain. You're going to see two different brain scans. Please log back into crowd.live forward slash spark to vote for which brain scan you believe is abnormal. We'll wait for a few minutes to let your votes come in. All right, 
So the correct answer is the scan on the left. The left is abnormal. On the right is the normal scan, which has the regular grooves on the surface of the brain right inside the skull, which is white on this screen. The dark space is what has the cerebrospinal fluid in the ventricles, and the gray part is the brain. On the scan in the left, the gray part is diminished, which means that the dark fluid is seen where normal tissue should be. So the brain has shrunken or atrophied. Luckily, our patient came back with a normal scan. So we'll send them for some lab work to ensure a clean bill of health. I'm gonna get some lab works to make sure there are no inflammation, uh, inflammatory markers. Cause whenever your body has inflammation, there are little markers that go around in your blood that we can just test and we'll see it and we'll say, okay, something's going on. Your body's trying to address something. That concluded our adult case. And now we're gonna talk about technology in medicine. So there have been a lot of technological advances that have happened in medicine over the past few years. We've got advanced telemedicine where you're looking at patients from in a different area and you're able to communicate with them and then also communicate with other people as you're having consultations with them. You may be able to show them other screens, et cetera. So that's a really good mechanism for using medicine. In terms of pharmacology, you, there is now a mechanism where you can have personalized medicine just for you. So there are medications that are specifically tailored to fit you and your DNA to help you with your condition because no two people are identical. Then you have the healthcare interoperability where systems, the pharmacist, pharmacy co uh, computers are able to communicate with the surgical computers, which are able to communicate with your primary care doctor's computers into, and it also communicate with the computer systems that are operating your personal devices. And so that's healthcare interoperability, able to communicate, share all that data in order to provide the best healthcare for you. Nanomedicine is where you have these nanoparticles that go into your body. You take it as a pill or an injection and it goes straight to the cell that's causing the problem. It ignores all your other healthy cells and goes straight to the problem cell and, and manages to deal with it there. So that's useful in cancer therapy. And then of course, 5G is not just for what we're using it for today. We're using it also to help capture and transmit data instantaneously. So as we're getting information from one of those uh, devices that we have, we're able to take that information and able to use it later on and move it towards uh, addressing the issue immediately. This is useful in, in the operating room when we're getting information and we're able to take care of it immediately. Then we have tricorders. Now, for those who are Star Trek fans, remember they would scan the, pay the person and they'd be able to know exactly what was wrong with them. Well, that exists. Tricorders, they collect data from multiple sources, runs it through an algorithm, and they're able to figure out what health condition you have and then take it from there. Then we have the digital assistants with artificial intelligence and, and virtual reality. And these assistants are there at our fingertips or at the computer, and they are helping us do what we need to do to take care of the patient. Smarter pacemakers using Bluetooth technology it automatically feeds information from your pacemaker to the computer or to your cell phone so that we know what to do with to do next. Tells the patient what they need to do, tells the physician on the other end what to do. Then we've got the CRISPR technology, which has, it's a lab on a chip. You're able to put a, a, so a sample of fluid or from the body and it automatically runs through the process and gives us the results immediately. And then of course, different wearables. You're used, you're used to the smart watches, but we've got the t-shirts that will be able to tell, see what's going on with your lungs, your heart, um, your skin. We've got devices that are attached to your wrist. Uh, of course, you know about the virtual reality goggles. Well, that we, they're also able to detect what's going on with your eyes. Uh, at the so special socks that are, are Bluetooth capable. So lots of different wearables with a purpose. And then doctors themselves, they can, you don't have to necessarily just do clinical work. You can also have careers in technology. So clinical informatics is, a, is one of the specialties that we have. And it combines clinical care, healthcare systems, and information technology. And then you put that together and you're able to give information to the various, uh, you work for any of these organizations. You, robotic surgery is, um, as you can see in that corner there, the doctors are in one corner and they're manning the robots and the robots are on the patient who's on the bed. They're able to do surgery on patients in a distant area or as well as in the room with them. 
AI and VR rehab or using it for medical education, et cetera. We use this when we're, if we're trying to practice or get ready for a surgical uh, procedure, or if we're trying to show our patients what it's going to look like, what we're about to do for them. If we want to give them rehabilitation without going to an actual center, they use the virtual reality and they're using that to do their rehab se um, sessions. And then of course, as a physician, if you've got that technology uh, information and skill set, you're able to help to lead others, be a consultant and, and teach others about what, how they can use technology, advise others how they can use technology in healthcare. So here's some of the frequently asked questions that P high school students have asked about medical careers. What's the difference between an MD and a DO? MDs are medical doctors. Uh, um, they go through the conventional mainstream medicine. About 93% of the docs in the US are MDs. DOs are doctors of osteopathy. They do everything the MDs doctors do, plus they do holistic methods using physical manipulations and adjustments. And about 77% of the docs in the US are DOs. What classes can I take now or in college that will help me if, to know if I like medicine? Biology will tell you about the living body. Sociology will tell you about humans, uh, human beings and how they uh, interact with one another. What extracurricular activities should I participate in during college to prepare me for medical school? Do community service, leadership activities, research projects. How can I get hands on a patient experience now? Like I said, volunteer, shadow. And you may also want to work as a scribe in a clinical setting. And what do you wish you knew before you went to medical school, before residency or before becoming a doctor? I wish I knew that it's okay not to know everything. You don't need to know everything. Things are always changing. That's why we have technology to help us. And you don't have to practice clinical medicine alone. You can do clinical medicine and other things like technology, music, arts within healthcare. So um, you don't only have to practice clinical medicine. And at the end of the day, the key thing is to plan early, do it for you, not for anyone else. Work hard, but remember to have fun, have a positive attitude and ask for help and guidance all the time from different people. You've got this. Thanks for joining me.